Well, good morning. Man, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And man, it's just a blessing to be in Sarasota. You people, it's just not fair, you know? <laughs> and it's just not. But I, I, that's the reason I know, uh, it's just one of the reasons you have smiles on your faces today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 13. And what a privilege it is to be here with you, but also just to be where I know Pastor Mike has invested so many years of his life. I love him. And I know you do too. And I'm uh, incredibly jealous of him at this point, too. So we're thinking. But in Acts 13, we're going to talk about life on mission. And every person here, when you talk about uh, a life on mission, sometimes you think of just missionaries. But every person here, God has called and has a specific purpose for. God placed you here to do more than draw a breath and draw a salary. He placed you here to be on mission. That's not something that you retire from. That's every day of your life, as long as you live on this earth. God has a purpose for you. We're going to look at that in Acts 13. Before we get there, though, if it's okay, I'd love to to, uh, introduce my family uh, to you. Just real quick, just real quick. And uh, I didn't bring them with me, so I brought a picture. And uh, this is my wife uh, there in the middle, Lynette. We have six kids and seven grandkids. If you count, they're not all in the picture. Uh, We left out the ones that weren't that cute. And so... uh, I'm just kidding. Some are just born, and so we didn't have the updated picture. But it's my wife, Lynette, in the middle. And, uh, and then we have three of our oldest kids. Our two daughters are in the front there. They each, one has three, one has four uh, children. And then our oldest son is in the back. That's his new wife to, his, to your left and his right. And uh, so we have those three. We had biologically. And then God blessed us with three additional children that we uh, uh, by his grace, adopted. The very first child we adopted was Libby. She's in the front middle there. We got Libby when she was one. They found her in a shoebox outside of a police station. And uh, no, we were very thankful that they found her. And we got her when she's one. She's now 19. She's a sophomore in college, going to be a pharmacist. And then um, the second child we adopted was Michael Lynn. She's on the far right there. She's from Ethiopia. We adopted her when she's three, and she's now 18. She's going to graduate in May if we don't kill her before then. So we're really excited about that. And so, no, Michael Lynn, she's so funny. We got her when she's three. She's always been kind of bossy. You know, that's her spiritual gift. You ever watched uh, Sanford and Son? You ever watched Sanford and Son? All right. We adopted Ann Esther. That's who we adopted. And so she walked into our neighbor's house when she was three, put her hand on her hip, and says, you people have issues. And... Uh, <laughs> And she said, your house is a mess. You have issues. We had to set her down and say, look, sweetheart, we're trying to make friends, and you're not helping, okay? So, and then there's J.M. on the far left. That's J.M., John Michael. He goes by J.M. He's from the Philippines. We adopted J.M. when he was 12, and he's now 22. And so uh, uh, he's, uh, he's something else. And so we have six kids from four different countries. So we walk in a restaurant. You know, people are like, how did that happen? Or, or, or in the South, people will see our family and say, well, bless your heart. I know what that means. That means better you than me. That's what that means. <clears throat> I said, there's no need to bless my heart. I'm just very competitive. No, no, no. What I mean is when we have six kids from four different countries. When we watch the Olympics, we win. All right? <laughs> we do. We have multiple opportunities to win every event. So... Uh, but one thing I want to tell you just real quick about J.M. J.M., we got him from the Philippines. We got him when he was 12. And so he knew some English when we got him. The other two did not. And so that helped a bit. But the very first night, can you imagine the very first night with your new family? I mean, they found J.M. wandering the streets when he was five. And they brought him to the orphanage. So he's in the orphanage from five to 12 for seven years. And they told us, now look, uh, he, uh, he, you have to be real careful when you take him uh, back to the, uh, back to the, uh, I was just looking at the countdown, it had four minutes on it, I was like, boy, that was short, that's a counting up, <laughs> but he said, be very careful with him when you take him back to the hotel, because we don't have hot water here, he could harm himself, now they had, he basically took sink baths from the time he was five until he was 12, and so, um, you can imagine, first night in the hotel, I'm letting him bounce on the bed, and doing all that type of thing, and I said, hey buddy, it's time to, time to take a bath, let me show you something, so we go in the bathroom, and uh, I said, look, I turned on the water, lukewarm. And then I, I said, let me have your hand. He gave me his hand, and I put his hand underneath the lukewarm water. And then I, I just gradually, gradually turned the water warmer 
and warmer and warmer until he felt hot water for the very first time. He said, that is wonderful. <laughs> I was like, it is wonderful. You're going to love it. I said, now here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go in there. You're going to take off your clothes and hop in the shower. And again, he knew English, but some things did not translate. He goes, shower, what's a shower? Well, I wasn't thinking, you know, he never had a shower. So I had to explain a shower to him. Have you ever explained a shower to somebody? It's not that easy. You know, it's like water from heaven. You're going to love it, you know. It's some of those things you just don't think about. Like the first time we went out to eat. I mean, we're so spoiled. You really are. Not only do you live in Sarasota and you're spoiled, but I mean, we're just spoiled, period. I mean, we went to, he wasn't used to going out to eat. He'd never been out to eat before. There's so many things on a menu, so many choices. He's used to just eating whatever they put in front of him. And he says, I don't know what to order. And I said, that's all right, I'll order for you. And so he came, I said, just bring him some chicken fingers. <laughs> He's like, no, I not eat chicken fingers. No, I said, no, 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 no. They're not chicken fingers. That's just what they call them. He said, why do they call them that? I was like, I don't really know. Just dip them in barbecue sauce. All right, it'll be all right. You can only imagine the first time we had buffalo wings. I mean, oh, my God. So many things you have to explain. But I'll never forget, he went there, took a shower, and 40 minutes later came out all shriveled up, but loving it. And still to this day, 10 years later, he still appreciates hot water. Why? Because he knows what it's like not to have it. We are basically pretty spoiled people. Now, you have a beautiful church here, and obviously living, you're sitting on padded pews in an environmentally controlled room. I mean, you're just spoiled. You're not worried about if you're going to have lunch. You're just about what you're going to have. Same thing is true when it comes to churches. And I'm at the North American Mission Board. What we do is we partner with churches like yours, which we have, to, to plant churches all over North America. You say, well, is that really necessary? And there are enough churches? There's not. That's why you're thinking spoiled, all right? It's not like it is here. You have one out of, in, in, in say, in Mississippi, there's one church for every uh, 1,300 people. All right, one for every 1,300. You go to a place like New York, there's one out of every 50,000. You go to Canada, there's one out of every 90,000. One for every 90,000 people. And we need, need more churches. We come alongside churches to help plant churches. Churches that plant churches that plant churches. You get that from mm, the book of Acts, okay? Let me show you just a, a few maps real quick. It's how what South Florida looked like several years ago. This is back in 2010. That's the church plants in South Florida. But because of churches like yours, a planted churches like you did in Venice and in other places, look, this is what it looks like today. Isn't that great? Now, yeah, you can do that. You go to a place like D.C. D.C., uh, this is what D.C., this is how many church plants there were in 2010. But because of your faithfulness and how you give to missions, this is what it looks like today. Now, that is about churches, planting churches that plant churches. That's what God has called us to do. And what I want you to do is your church, even if you go back in your history, was planted by a church. Someone planted this church. God used someone to plant the church. And God used someone to plant the church that planted your church. And God used somebody to plant the church that planted the church that planted the church that planted your church. You go back far enough, and you see in Acts 13... We see the church of Antioch send out their very best, Paul and Barnabas. At the time, it was Barnabas and Saul, they called them. They sent out their very best to do what? To plant churches. And then we see in the second missionary journey, they go back to check up on those churches. But let's just look and see the, where the ultimate mission next step. And what I want you to see today at the end of this is that what is your missional purpose? God placed you here for a purpose. A greater purpose. What is that? And what is your next missional step? Acts 13 says this. Let's start in verse 1. And uh, just throw it up there for me if you would. Acts 13. There we go. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. It lists them all there. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them. And help me with these next three words. You ready? 
sent them off. Let's say it again. You ready? Sent them off. It's very important that you remember that. You sent them off. So often churches start focusing on who they can keep rather than who they should send off. You can tell the success of a church not by its seating capacity, but by its sending capacity. God placed you here to send people off into the mission field, to multiply your ch- ch- uh, yourself, to be a multiplying church, to send them off. The church of Antioch sent them off. The church of Jerusalem was all about itself. It's all about itself. That's why I encourage you, as you look for a new pastor, you're going to determine, hey, has it got more focused on taking care of who we have or really focused on who we need to reach? God did not place you here to maintenance. God placed you here to reach people and to send them off, okay? So look what it says in Acts 13 when it says, sent them off, it said they prayed and fast, they laid their hands on them, and sent them off. What does that mean? It means they ordained them, right? No, that's not what that means, actually. What they're saying is, as you go, Barnabas and Saul, as you go, we go. You go on this first missionary journey, but as you go, we go. We're not actually going, but as you go, we go. God has a role for us to play, and we've got your back. One thing about being on mission is being sent they were sent they sent them off and as they sent them off it wasn't just we celebrate them going we continually had their back as we prayed for them when we got your back you go we go we're going through you okay second thing i want you to see is not only being sent is being being obedient look at this next uh, verse that we have we're going to put it up and uh, it says, so being sent out by who? The Holy Spirit. They went down to sell you see. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. John Mark, who was Barnabas' nephew. Okay? There's a couple things we need to notice here about being obedient. They were sent out by who? The Holy Spirit. When you're sent out by the Holy Spirit, you need to understand uh, a couple of things. One, when you're truly sent out by the Holy Spirit, when your life is truly led by the Holy Spirit, you understand that you're completely dependent upon the Lord. Every one of us are completely dependent upon Him for the breath that we breathe. Everything. Sometimes in life we become successful and we get A good bit of miles behind us, we think we can pretty well take care of ourselves. But often God has to paddle shock us to say, look, hey, you may be, uh, you may think you're self-sustaining, but you're not. You're completely dependent upon me. So to be led by the Holy Spirit, to follow the Holy Spirit, it means is to have the understanding, look, I'm thankful for what I have, but I am completely dependent upon him. Every one of us are. The second thing is you have to be completely flexible. If you notice the different places that they went, and they started in Cyprus. That's like going to the Bahamas. All right? And all these different places. It's really easy places at first, and then it got really difficult as they went along. But what I appreciate about Saul and Barnabas, uh, Saul who eventually becomes Paul, they changed his name to Paul, is they were flexible. They had a game plan, but realized that, that God may redirect them at any time. The old football term of calling an audible. We have a play, I have a thought in mind, here's where I feel like I'm headed, but I'm really open to whatever God has, whenever He has it. My life is an empty legal pad. God, you fill it in, and I'll follow. Being fo- following the Holy Spirit means you're completely dependent and also completely flexible, and that's exactly what they were. Okay? Anytime you're sent, and anytime you're, you're dependent, uh, be, uh, obedient, you're going to be challenged. And that's the third part, being challenged. They are challenged, and look what it says in this next passage uh, of Acts 13. 
when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elmas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now, um, let me just summarize exactly what happened here. The governor of that area said, I have heard what Paul and Barnabas have been talking about. I want to hear more. I'm intrigued. His right-hand man, chief of staff, if you will, his proconsul, says, not a good idea. You see... If you do that, there's going to be some, un, you know, some uh, unforeseen circumstances not going to be helpful to your political career. For whatever reason, he was there and, and challenged what the governor wanted to do and said, don't go that way. You don't need to hear what they have to say. We need to stay away from them. Barnabas made it really clear. I mean, I'm sorry. Paul made it really clear to this particular guy. Like, look, you... Basically, he said, you're a son of the devil. He focused specifically on the challenge and said, look, um, you are in the way here, and God has a word for him and wants to speak to him. And I won't go into all the details, but what I want you to see is when you're completely dependent upon the Lord, completely flexible and led by the Holy Spirit, there are going to be challenges. Sometimes we think if we're completely sold out to the Lord, completely in line and completely in God's will, it's all going to go good. And if it's going good, well, we must be doing what God wants us to do. And if it's going rough or we're getting challenges, well, we must be doing something wrong. That's not what God wants us to do. That's not how you need to think. When you're on mission, look, not everybody's going to be for it. And in this case, people on the outside, the outside were against it but they stayed focused, and they did it anyway. But not only will people on the outside often be against it when you're doing the right thing, sometimes people on the inside will be a problem. I'm sure you don't have that here at your church, but when I pastor a church, we always had we always people that seemed to just, they thought their spiritual gift was one of criticism. You know? <laughs> when I pastored, I had guys that would sit there, and you could just, you know, you could just tell the snarl on their face. You just want to have them, hey, brother, just stand and lead us in a word of criticism. I can tell you I have it, you know. <laughs> and when I found it, when I went from church to church, I found that, that sometimes the, the most critical among us, they, they moved with me. <laughs> no, they didn't actually move, but they showed up by a person of another name. There was always somebody like that. I, it was just amazing to me. There's always going to be pushback. There's always going to be challenges, typically from the outside, but also from the inside there's going to be issues. And you just got to understand that's a part of it. Being faithful and on mission, there's going to be challenges. You notice here it mentions that John Mark was with them. If you go back this afternoon in John 13, and because of time I've got to keep moving, but if you read more about what happened, midway through here, even the very first part, John Mark, who was Barnabas' nephew, he leaves and goes back home to Jerusalem. Well, Paul didn't say anything about it at the time, but it really chapped him. It really ticked him off. A little snot. A little pansy. He's fine when we're going to Cyprus. Oh, yeah, who wouldn't want to do Bahamas for Jesus, right? But when it got tough, it got difficult, who wanted to run home to their mama? John Mark. And that's exactly what happened. He went back home. Now, if you would, let's just freeze the story here for a second. I need to fast forward and show you what else happened to, to, to explain my point. They're going to finish the first missionary journey, but let's fast forward to the second missionary journey. All right, hold it over here. We're going to go over here. Paul and Barnabas decided to go on a second missionary journey and go back and visit where all the churches that they started on the first. And so Paul says, Barnabas, let's go back and check on everybody. He says, sounds good to me. He says, I'll call John Mark and see if he wants to go too. He says, do what? John Mark, your nephew? He goes, yeah, I want to see if he can go too. He was like the first summer missionary, you know, uh, intern, if you will. And he says, no, 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 no. We're not taking the kid with us this time. 
Brahma says, what do you mean we're not taking him with us? Of course we're going to take him. I, he's my I want to take him with us. It'd be good for him to learn. He goes, no, no, no. First time, the kid bailed on us. He's too much trouble. It's not like you can just go put him on a plane and fly him home back then. It was a lot of trouble. He said, he's not going. He goes, yes, he is. No, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. And if you read, it says there was no small disagreement. You know what that means in the Greek? There was no small disagreement. That's what it means. It was a big disagreement. It was no small thing. They got into a big deal where basically Barnabas said, Look, Paul, if you're going to be that way, then I'll take John Mark and go that way, and you go that way. Paul says, oh, You know what? Not a bad idea, Barnabas. I'll get Silas. Silas, come on. You go with me. And that was the second missionary journey, and Paul and Barnabas, I mean, Barnabas and John Mark went the other way. I mean, that's awkward. Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas the encourager, having this dispute. My point is you can have challenges from the outside, but also you can have internal challenges too. Now, what I love about this is Paul was type A, and he was a, a, char, you know, a hard charger. And you can imagine he and Silas going down the road saying, man, Barnabas, you know, I know he's the encourager, but my word, he's such a soft spot for his nephew, and he's got to be focused on the main thing. You can imagine just really frustrated. Meanwhile, on the other road, going the other way, here's Barnabas, puts his arm around John Mark, says, John Mark, look, man, everybody makes mistakes. Hey, what you did the first time, that was not the most helpful thing, and I uh, hope you learn from it. But we serve a God of a second chance, and a third chance, and a fourth chance. And I'm sure as he went on, encouraging John Mark, and John Mark had to feel terrible, because He's going the opposite direction with his uncle because of him. He's the reason. But Barnabas encourages and says, John Mark, look, I really believe in you, and I believe God has something special for you. And who knows, maybe John Mark, who knows, maybe even one day, you may even write a book. <laughs> That's where we get our Gospel of Mark. My point's this. Every one of us are being sent. We must be obedient. You're going to be challenged. Sometimes on the outside. And sometimes there's going to be people in this room or in the other service that are going to do things that just, just fly all over you. It's like, I do not understand that. It's real easy to pick up all your toys and go somewhere else. It's real easy to do that. That's a simple, easy way. The more mature way is to understand, look, things like that are going to happen. And our mission is greater than any type of challenge that we're going to encounter. It sure helps you to prepare for it to come. You know what I love about this, though? Although there were challenges, they were faithful and focused to the finish. Paul was faithful and focused to the finish. If you read Acts 13, regardless of what challenges they went through, you know what he stayed focused on? Repentance. You know what he stayed focused on? Jesus. Man, what a blessing to have two baptisms today. You know what this church is about? That. Not about what song we sing, how we sing it, what order things are in. I remember when I was pastor at a church, I had a lady come up to me once, and she said, uh, Pastor, and I thought, man, it was a great service. We had a guest speaker. She could be complaining about me, you know. And, uh, and, and she said, I said, what a great service. She said, I guess so, but the flags are on the wrong side of the platform. I'm like, do what? And she said, the flags are on the wrong side. The American flag, the Christian flag, you need to switch them. Of course, I just said, I didn't have enough maturity at that point. I just said, who gives a rip, you know? <laughs> They're on the wrong side. Go, go move them, for crying out loud. He said, well, it's important. I, I realized the respect and all. It wasn't intended. Somebody just put them on the wrong side after VBS. It was just one of those things. But my point is, the most important thing, you have to stay focused on why you exist. Amen. Exist so that that happens. People come to know Christ Amen. and are baptized.
Paul, if you read Acts 13, stayed faithful and focused to the finish. But it doesn't mean he wasn't discouraged. It doesn't mean you'll never be discouraged either. And that's why we're in Acts 13, all right? Acts 13. We're going to fast forward. You ready? Acts 14, 15, 16, I'm going fast, 17, and Acts 18. Acts 18, verse 9 and 10, I'm going to put it on the screen. It's a verse that the Lord came to Paul in a vision or a dream when Paul was at his perhaps most discouraged point. Even the Apostle Paul gets discouraged. He was down. Doing the right thing doesn't mean it's always going to be smooth sailing and doesn't mean you're always going to feel happy about it. He was discouraged. And the Lord knew exactly where he was and what he was going through. And in his darkest point of night, he comes to Paul and says this. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid. But go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. There's two things, just leave that verse up there if you would. There's two things I want you to see on that verse. The first thing that the Lord says to Paul is what? Say it with me. Do not be You know what's interesting about that? He's in the Greek, it actually means, Paul, stop being afraid. He was afraid, and the Lord was saying, stop it. Don't do that. Stop being afraid. You're afraid. Stop being afraid. Stop it. Do not be afraid. The second thing he says is what? Go on speaking and do not be silent. You keep on speaking. What? About repentance. You stay faithful and focused to the finish. You keep on speaking and do not be silent means you do not quit. Keep doing what you're doing, Paul. You keep speaking and do not quit. So basically he's saying, do not be afraid and do not quit. Do not be what? Afraid and do not quit. Do not be afraid and do not quit. I'd say the same thing to a church in transition. Waiting for a new pastor. We have the same Savior, you're just getting a new pastor, okay? <laughs> Let's don't overthink this thing. <laughs> a lot has not changed. The reason you're here, and hopefully it's because of him and not because of whoever is up here. But whatever you do, do not be afraid. And you do not quit. I love it because he doesn't leave it there. If you put the verse, just leave the verse up there if you would. He says, do not be afraid, do not quit. But then he tells us it would just be a spiritual pep rally if that was it. But notice what he says. For I am what? That changes everything. It's not just a spiritual pep rally of don't be afraid and don't quit. No, he's saying stop being afraid and you do not quit because I'm with you. It changes everything. I'm going to be there with you. That changes everything. Whatever might come your way tomorrow changes everything because you know he's with you. It changes the whole perspective of life, the way you live life when you have that type of worldview, biblical worldview that he is with us at all times. He never leaves us or forsakes us. I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death because he will never, ever leave us. Now, I need to to confess something real quick. I'm a Kentucky fan, okay? I'm from, I live in Atlanta. That's where the North American Mission Board is, but I'm a Kentucky fan. And uh, I know you people like football here uh, quite a bit. Kentucky, it's not a thing, all right? It's just not. It's more of an appetizer before the meal. Um, In Kentucky, if a tornado comes, we all run to the football field because there's very few touchdowns there. All right? That's the reason. (laughs) I know, I know, I know, I know. Dad joke, dad joke. I'm a basketball fan. My wife and I got married on December 28, 1985. Okay? She has one sister and did not grow up competitive. 
I, on the other hand, Kentucky, we're basketball people, very competitive. We feel like we contribute. What I mean is when we watch it on TV, we feel like we're helping. <laughs> so when we watch on TV, I'd get up real close to the TV and, and the referees. I would encourage them to do better next time <laughs> in a loud voice so they could hear. <laughs> the opponent team, you know, I would root against them or the coach at oftentimes. He might forget someone was on the... I'd make sure he knew who he could put in next. If a player didn't do well, I was just trying to help encourage him, be a better person, and do it better next time. But my point was, we were newlyweds, and I was very into the game, and I would, I would get very vocal. And, it, and this is right in the first month of our marriage, December, January, February. Our biggest marriage blowout happened in March. <laughs> it's still celebrated today in something called March Madness, all right? <laughs> She's like, you have issues. You have a problem. <laughs> You're way too competitive. This is ridiculous. And I thought she was joking at first. And she, you know, she communicated to me that she was not. So I had to make some adjustments. You guys know how that happens. And so I decided to do something. I decided to do, uh, uh, I, I, the only way I can do this is I can't watch these things live. I just get too into it. And so I'm going to tape them. She said, what do you do? You tape them and then you don't find out the score and you, you watch it later? No, no, that's not how I do it. I tape them. I find out the score. And if we win, I watch it. <laughs> if we lose, I delete it. <laughs> so only games I watch, we win. <laughs> we beat Alabama last night. Going to go home and watch that baby five or six times, all right? <laughs> do you know what's beautiful about that is? I can tell you right now, there's a game we played about 10, 12 years ago. I love to watch this game. I watched it 30 times. We played Michigan in the tournament. All right, what I love about the game is we were down 10 points at halftime. And, and the announcers were like negative. So, I mean, all this negativity. Kentucky was this and that, but now they're behind. They're never going you know, to come back. It's too insurmountable lead. They were negative, negative, negative. Did that bother me at all? <laughs> Not at all. No, I knew we won. <laughs> so you guys can all you want, but we win in the end. So I'm at the refrigerator making me another peanut butter and jelly. I'm just, I'm just ready for the second half. I'm going to watch it just take place. And so sure enough, 10 minutes to go in the second half. We're still down by eight. Woo! Five minutes to go, we're down by six. One minute to go, we're down by two, and they have the ball. Am I nervous? Not on your life. <laughs> I'm petting my dog. <laughs> no problems here. Because I know what happens. I've seen it before. Forty seconds to go, we steal the ball. We come down, we pass it around. Ten, five. Four, we're going to get a shot off? I bet we do. <laughs> they throw it over to a guy named Aaron Harrison, and one second to go, he shoots it, and it goes in. <laughs> and we win every time. <laughs> now, my point is, it's a totally different perspective watching that game when you know you win. It just takes all the stress out of it. There's no fear. None whatsoever. I didn't want to quit watching it because I knew we were going to win the end. Paul was told by the Lord, stop being afraid. You keep on doing what you're doing. I got this. The last part of the verse, he says, I got many people in this city, Paul, that you know not of. You know what he's saying there? There's many people in this city that I'm going to use you to reach, and you don't even know their names yet. You don't, but I do. I've got much I'm going to do through you. You just be faithful and focused to the finish. You do not quit. You stop being afraid. Because I'm going to use you in ways you've never seen before. And I'm thankful for all that God has done through your church. So thankful. There's no need to be afraid. 
there's absolutely no reason to quit because there are many people in this city that you know not of yet. I want us to bow our heads. The most important thing you could do is to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's the reason this church exists. That God loved you so much He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that you might have life and have it everlasting. And give you opportunity to do that. At the end of our service, there'll be people here who would love to talk with you about that. Take your next missional step, and it's the first missional step is to know Him. So maybe you're here today and you're a believer. You've kind of been on the sidelines watching, and like one of the most dangerous places in life can be in a missions minded church because you're around missions minded people and they're doing mission minded things, but you're not actually participating. I want to ask you, specifically you, and what is your next missional step? God's called you to be in the game. Father, I thank you today for the privilege of knowing you. I thank you, Lord, that you are with us, that you never leave us or forsake us. And if there's fear today, Lord, I pray for whatever reason, be it health, financial, relational, whatever it be, Lord, that you help calm those fears that they stop being afraid. Lord, if anyone here tempted to give up on a relationship, to give up and throw their hands on anything for any reason, Lord, that you give them the strength to not quit. Because you are with us. We thank you for how you love us. There's not one thing we go through, you're not there. Thank you that, Lord, you give us a sense of purpose. That you saved us. And we can live on mission. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.